All right, we're finally on to analyzing our data. Welcome back. All right, so first step, we have, so we have applied bias dark and flat frames to our images. We have flipped over, we have accounted for the meridian flip if we've needed to, and we have stabilized the images. So the next step is now to actually analyze them. So we're gonna open and import our image sequence. So this is where we saved all of our files. This is just to make sure our main folder, wasp52b. Uh, and we have stabilized our images. That was the last step that we did. We processed the meridian flip and all that. That was great. But the last step was stabilization. So we're going to import those. And we have, again, 360 images, starting with number one. Perfect. So these are all ready to be analyzed. Everything's in the right place. Everything's stable. The whole image is the same brightness all the way across. It's great. Just adds up. I don't know if you guys noticed this uh, when we were looking at this. A little bit of shift there. That's OK. Um, but do you guys notice this little fuzzy spot down here? I checked with our uh, resident professor, and he said that that's a galaxy, so isn't that cool? Um, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking for analyzing our data here. So, first of all, what star are we looking at? We're looking for WASP-52b. Now, when we're looking for this, uh, this was something that was on the Exoplanet Transit Finder page. Actually, I had this open from the last time we were doing this with WASP-44b. Um, you can see annotated here, if we open annotated, which we did at the time, you get a map like this. So if you haven't found, if you didn't save that map, that's okay. Just go back and find your, your uh, transit there just by searching the, the date and time for the time that we took these images, uh, and you'll be able to find your transit. For us, that's in our folder. I saved it earlier. Uh, this is what we started off with here. Um, oh, it's not quite. It's upside down. Um, we started off with this, which is all well and good, except this is in a different spot. That starts down here. So what we need to do is flip it horizontally. You can use whichever program you have on your computer to do that. It needs to essentially, this part needs to flip down here, and that part needs to flip up here. It can also be accomplished by flipping it twice and then flipping it vertically. This, is, this program only lets you do that, so that's what we've done. Here's the correct orientation, all flipped around. Anyway, the main point is that this is, so we have this bright star here, and that bright star is down there. You can actually see the galaxy right here in this image. See that? There's a galaxy there. Cool. Um, so we're looking for this star, which is directly above the galaxy and off. There's these three bright stars in a row here, and it's down about there. So we've got those three bright stars here. This is our target star right in the middle. Perfect. So you want to remember where that is, because that's what we're doing science on. Now... When we're doing science, what we're doing is called multi-aperture photometry. That's this button here. Um, essentially, you what you're doing is you're looking at your target star. We want to see how the brightness of this thing changes over the length of time of this exposure. To the untrained eye, or to anyone who's not a computer, uh, it doesn't look like it changed much, but it has. But we have to figure that out by asking the program to measure the brightness in a certain area and then comparing it to other stars nearby. Generally speaking, when you are doing this, you'll want to find your target star and only test for the stars, uh, measure the stars that are close by to it, uh, just because we know that they're generally in the same area and, uh, and things out here on the edges may disappear as the image is stabilized, right? So we're going to start at frame one, so back here, and take a look at the aperture that happens when you open up the program. It may be different for you. Um, if this is not up, if these little blue circles aren't on your cursor when you open the program, that button is here. It's these two red circles. Um, and you can, oopsies, these two red circles, they bring up the rest of the apertures like that. Um, so make sure you have all of them set up. What we want is to keep the stars really tightly enclosed in the inner circle. And generally speaking, we're going to be choosing stars that are more or less the same size. So like these stars here are all really good. Um, this star would be bad because it's much, much bigger. So we're going to choose stars of more or less the same size, uh, which means that we're going to want to make these circles smaller. So to do that, to change the aperture, we go to this little set button here. So it says change aperture settings. Click on that. Um, ours are actually like not too bad right now. They're pretty tight in. We could maybe change this to 4, that to 7, and that to 10. Um, it's a little bit tighter. That's better. Mainly what you don't want is something that's like not that. That'd be insane. Um, here's what they are when they are 
too big. So this is far too large for our star. It's not bad for this star, but for our target star, it's too big. So we're gonna set that to something that feels right. Again, this will depend a little on what your target star looks like, how big it is, how bright it is. Uh, so just, you kind of have to make the call on this one, just whatever feels right. You kind of want to contain that star in the inner circle there. Once we have the aperture set up all nice and we are happy with it, we can actually start to get to the processing, which you do with this button here. This is called the Perform Multi Aperture Photometry button. So we're going to click that. Um, there's a couple things you want to check on this page here. So the first off is that you want the first slice to be number one. Sometimes if you've scrolled through on this little scrolly wheel, it'll be like part way through which is not great because then we only do science on the last bit. So make sure that's all the way at one and this is all the way at the end of your stack of images. Make sure these are all unclicked because uh, it'll be doing, we don't need them to be open. If you click this, then old apertures may show up. So don't do that. Uh, and then make sure that these two are clicked and that these two are clicked. Alrighty, we're gonna place our apertures. There's a little cheat sheet over here Essentially what you want to do is find your target star and click it first. So this is our target star and click towards the center. If you're not right on center, it does actually adjust to put it right in the center, which is great for people with shaky hands. Um, I'm going to use this star here, which is a bit of an odd shape, but that's okay. So you left click with this one and that's the target star. The target star is green. Every left click after that will be a check star. So those are stars that we are comparing the brightness to. Um, the reason that we, have check stars in the first place is because um, if we just look at the brightness of the star in general, it could vary wildly because of the atmosphere or because of clouds coming in or what have you, um, not necessarily because of the exoplanet transit. So we, we look at the exoplanet transit for this, but we also look at the uh, what these other stars in the frame are doing. Um, usually these stars will be stars that don't vary, don't change in brightness, or they don't have an exoplanet going around them, which means that they'll be good check stars uh, to compare this to. However, we don't know that for sure, so we will have to sort of do a bit of trial and error here. So I'm going to choose a bunch of stars. These are all good. The more check stars you have, the more accurate your data, but you only need like three. We'll include a bunch. Okay, so now we have our target star and we have one, two, three, four, five check stars. Once we have those all out, you can hit the right click button and it'll start to process. Here we go. Awesome, there's our data all processed. It's looking pretty good. Looks like we have a nice steady uh, line up at the top on either end of our transit and a big dip in the middle. So that's really good. A whole bunch of these frames have popped up and I, I will tell you what they all mean right now. This is our plot, so this is the brightness of the star that we that is our target star. This, is, this says it's a relative flux of target one, so relative flux means just the brightness change uh, compared to itself over time. So that's looking good. We have this one, which allows you to change the plot in the data uh, and or what data you plot. We'll get to that in more detail in a second. We've got this one, which allows you to change some of the settings on the on the chart, so the titles, the subtitles, extra markers, that sort of stuff. Um, we'll turn that off for now. Then we've got this, which is all of our measurements. Look at that, look at all that data, delightful. Um, this has a whole bunch of information in it. You can actually download this and plot some stuff in Excel instead if you want to, but I find Astro MSJ works okay for this. And the last frame that we have is this one. This is uh, where the reference, so you can actually set the reference stars to mean certain things, and this tells you what the reference stars are up to. So here's the target star, and then these are all the check stars. Now we have a bit of an issue here. So C3, star C3, has some issue, some issue that I'm not sure why it is. We can actually plot it and check, but what it is, it says the aperture peak count over linearity limit. So essentially what it's checking for is that C2, C3, C4, and C5, and C6 are all linear, that the that the brightness stays the same over time. So C3 is not doing that. We can actually check this by going to our multi-plot wide data window and plotting C3. This is C3 here. There's a little thing that says plot. <clears throat> we can plot it. Let's see what it says. Okay, so something's going on down here, that it's dimming a lot and then it's getting brighter and it's dimming a lot and it's getting brighter. So 
not really sure what that is, uh, but it's an abnormality and it's probably messing up our data over here a little bit. So we're going to close all these windows. Don't worry, we can get them back. And C3, so this was C1, or so T1 because we clicked it first. That was T2, C2 because we clicked it second, and this is C3. So basically what we want to do is redo this, uh, this whole process without this check star. So there's a button to get rid of these apertures uh, and place new ones. That button is this one here. So it's called the Clear Apertures and Annotations from Overlay. It's a little broom sweeping the apertures away. Perfect. We're going to once again do uh, aperture multi-aperture photometry. Sometimes this is checked, this use previous six ap apertures. If you do that, all the same apertures are going to show up as you clicked last time. So let's not do that. We're going to place our own apertures again. Here's our target. This one was fine. It was that star that was an issue. So we're going to do the next star over still. Good, it centered it for us because I have terrible shaky hands. And then these two stars, which were also fine. Perfect. We've got only four check stars now. That's okay. If you want to add another, you can, but it might end up being one of those ones that doesn't fit with the linearity. And then we're going to right click and process. And that's it for us. Okay, so this is looking better. Interestingly enough, because we plotted this other star last time, it has plotted it again, even though it's a different star now uh, this time. So you can just take that off for now so that we can just see this. Um, don't worry about that second line. I'll uh, also tell you guys how to make it move down below your graph the way it, it was there. But for now, this is looking pretty good. All of our check stars are good to go. Our target star is looking good. We've, I would say we look like we found an exoplanet because that follows nicely. But we do have to check some stuff. So first of all, we're going to go to this panel. This is the multiplot main panel. Um, now, when we did our hypothesis and we filled out the exoplanet data form, we have predicted values for the ingress and the egress of the planet. For this planet, these are our predicted values. I brought, I found them on Exoplanet Transit Finder. Um, these values, uh, it's it's kind of interesting. So it's plotted it in decimal values, and it says geocentric Julian date. So the Julian date comes up. Um, we we wrote it down in our data Exoplanet data forms as well. It's a weird number, and I'll actually show you guys here. This is the Julian date. 2458722.861, and um, that changes over time. Sometimes Julian date is presented without the first two numbers, so they just subtract 2,400,000, and you get just 58,722. That gives you a good idea of the past couple years of data of Julian date times. Um, what they've done here is just take away that 2458722 and just plotted the decimal after it. So that's just after this point, everything over here. So we can find that again in our data for us. It's 0.775 and 0.851. This allows you to put vertical markers in. So you can check these buttons to add in the predicted ingress and predicted egress values. Uh, and then the other step that you can take is you can add in where the meridian flip was. So this may um, have some impact on your data, so it's worth adding in. Uh, we don't have the meridian flip time readily available, but we know what file uh, after which the meridian flip affected it, and that was file 331. Uh, and so if we take a look at the Julian date for that file, all we need is these last these last digits. Uh, and so that's the ones after the decimal because that's all that's plotted on the graph. So um, we want to remember 0.872466 and then we can add that in here. 0.872466. And then you can show that on the graph. So that'll show, oh, there we go. Uh, that'll show where the meridian flip happened. So you'll notice with our data, the data kind of jumped up a little bit after the meridian flip. So may have been that flipping the images caused some slight error in our data. So that's all you need to do if you're just doing basic analysis. You get the idea of uh, what the planet has been doing around its star and whether or not it lined up with predicted ingress and egress and if the meridian flip caused any issues. If you want to do more extensive analysis or if your class has decided to spend another class session on more extensive analysis, stay tuned for the next tutorial and I'll show you guys what else you can do to process this data and see what else has happened in the night sky with your star. See you guys next time.